All right. Well, I guess we'll get going on this. Any uh, any questions from the Bible or from the things that we've looked at? Make sure I didn't leave anybody on a cliffhanger or anything. Okay. So we're actually looking at four books in the English Bible tonight, uh, but it's actually two books uh, in the Hebrew Bible. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, first off, Chronicles, and we're getting towards the end of the books of history. Then we'll go to the books of prophet, books of the uh, books of the prophets. Although that's actually separated differently in the English Bibles uh, from the he- Hebrew Bibles too. Uh, we call it. Well, we'll get to that some other time. Probably get to it uh, next week. But uh, so at first glance, you you read Chronicles, and it kind of just seems like an unnecessary book at first glance. It seems like it's repeating information from Kings, and so it's kind of like, I just read this in Kings, why are we going over it again? Uh, but when you when you stop and take a longer look at Chronicles, it, it's, it's extremely unique from Kings, even though it covers the exact same time period. Um, think of it kind of like uh, the Gospels. I mean, all four of the Gospels basically cover the same period of time, a little bit different. I mean, for instance, John goes into the pre-existent Jesus. <laughs> but, I mean, besides that, they all kind of cover the same, uh, the same, you know, uh, span of time. But they have four different things to say. And so I, I, it's kind of similar to that. Um, so you, you read Chronicles, and it seems like, okay, we're going through Kings again. But... Uh, one thing that's unique about Chronicles, and I'll explain why this is significant in a minute, but Chronicles actually starts with the genealogies, kind of like we've already heard from Genesis, and it kind of repeats a lot of that stuff there. Um, so it starts with the genealogies, and then it goes and lists the kings, but it doesn't list all the kings. It only lists the kings of Judah, the southern kings which is very significant. We'll get to that in just a minute. But there's uh, nine things that we should probably consider about uh, Chronicles. The first, Chronicles follows Judah's kings, not Israel's, the south, not the north. Um, This is because it is following the promise of God that David would never lack for someone on the throne. So you have it follow through David's line up until the very end. And this is the way that Second Chronicles ends. Let me read it straight from the Bible. Hold on. The very last bit of Second Chronicles, chapter 36, it reads this. I'll start in verse 22. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Go up then. And it transitions perfectly into Ezra and Nehemiah. And we see here the, the, the idea of the promise being kept by God. Even when you get to a little bit before that decree is given, uh, for instance, in verse, um, let's see, I think it's around 19 or so. Let's start in 19 and see if that's it. So then they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. He took into exile those who had escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by his mouth to Jeremiah, of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbath. All the days of its desolation, is it's, uh, it kept the Sabbath until 70 years were complete. Uh, and so you see Zedekiah taken into captivity, and it mentions um, that he is still alive. So um, it follows Judah's kings, not Israel's, and it does this to show that God's promise is still, still in effect, that God's people still have um, a legacy. Uh, and uh, you kind of see these two conflicting things that people typically don't believe both. But you see Chronicles teaches both of them. It teaches kingship given by God, which was not a, a new idea. I mean, throughout human history, lots of different people have said that, that kings were appointed by God. That's not so unique. But Chronicles goes to the other side, too, and says, but it's also conditional. So it's like, yes, it's given by God, but it also is conditional. And you don't really find that typically uh, in human thinking. <laughs> we we kind of go to one side or the other. Uh, and then the second thing to consider about the books of Chronicles, first and second, um, is that throughout the stories, it downplays the role of evil. 
if you read in Kings, it highlights every evil thing, right? Like, it, it even skips over things that were very significant, politically speaking, just to emphasize the fact of the evil being done. But in Chronicles, it goes to the other extreme, and it kind of just downplays the evil while highlighting the righteousness. For instance, in Second Samuel, King David's sin with Bathsheba is a big point of the entire book. To my knowledge, I don't believe that First Chronicles even mentions it. Don't think so. Could be wrong. Look that up on your own. Let me know if I'm wrong. But I don't think that it even mentions it. Uh, and uh, this is just kind of what I'm talking about. Chronicles just kind of downplays the evil things. Um, if it was, if Chronicles was a modern day preacher, we would we would call it the the sugarcoating pastor, leaving out the the wrath of God. But it does it for a very important reason. The reason why it does that is because it's highlighting the victories, not the defeats. And the reason why it does that is because the people were already defeated. They were already broken. They already had no purpose. So it was highlighting rather the victories of their of their religious legacy to give, bring them forward to where they were going. Even the way that the book ends, go, go back and get rebuilding on stuff. And so, so faith and salvation are, are, are both highlighted. Um, salvation, obviously, by means of through David's line. Uh, and if you read through, uh, Chronicles oftentimes breaks off in these, it seems like long kind of asides where it'll be talking about um, like the priests or the singers and all these different things that don't really seem significant. But for the purpose of Chronicles, it's extremely important because it's trying to show the legacy of the faith that they have. And it's trying to show them, you know, back back to your roots, back to back to the truth of, of what God left us. Um, the third thing to, to consider about the books of Chronicles um, it emphasizes the legacy of God's people, be they singers or religious experiences that they've gone through or whatever. Uh, fourth thing to consider, discrepancies. There, are, There's a, a discrepancy, at least one. There, there's a number of discrepancies, but this is the, really the big one. Um, between Kings and Chronicles, uh, in the account where David does a census of Israel, Kings and Chronicles both give different numbers uh, for how many Israel numbered. This is a huge discrepancy, and the reason why it is there, don't get too upset here, there's a reason why it's there, because Joab was, was the commander of David's army. He did the one who did the census, and it says that he lied about the numbers. He, he did not give David the correct number. It brought a curse from God and, and all that, but still the correct number was not, um, not recorded. So that's the reason for the discrepancy. Uh, the fifth thing to consider about the books of Chronicles. Chronicles is a very, very cool book because it is, it's, it's a Bible commentary is what it is. If you read through Chronicles, you see him constantly referencing um, other sources. And it's not like in Kings where, where the writer was referencing, you know, where, like citing his sources for where he got the information. It's more where he's citing things through the lens of, applying it to them. Like, for instance, here's a great example. Uh, Chronicles is the one that says, um, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, you know, I will turn and, and bless them. That, I can't remember right now, it's because it's off the top of my head, but that is from Chronicles. And the point being, Israel's going back to the promised land, and he's trying to encourage them to get their eyes on God and to turn away from their sins, to, to start fresh. This is a new, a second chance. You're getting a second chance. How many people can say that? Don't mess it up, guys. And it's kind of like the overriding theme there. He constantly quotes Jeremiah. He constantly quotes um, the different books from earlier in the Bible. So you, when you read through Chronicles, try to pay attention uh, to who he, who he references, who he cites, and why. Uh, because Chronicles is definitely a Bible commentary. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, and this is kind of interesting, uh, it's placed after Ezra and Nehemiah. So in our Bible, it goes First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. But in the Hebrew Bible, it goes First, King, first and Second Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles. And the reason for that being is because it once again is, is a commentary. It's more meant to be something not to repeat information, but rather kind of give um, interpretation on the information that you read. The sixth uh, point to consider, whereas First Samuel gave the entire book, well, uh, over half the book at least, to Saul and his rise to power and all that, the start of the kingship, significant events. Chronicles doesn't really seem to care what Saul did in his lifetime. And the reason, obviously, being because there was never a covenant between God and Saul. There was one between God and David. So right, and Saul's really only mention, uh, mentioned as it applies to him being the 
predecessor to David. <laughs> and so when David is mentioned, it's pretty much right off the bat when it mentions uh, da- God's covenant with David. Pretty much right off the bat. So, okay, uh, the seventh thing to consider, uh, the genealogies and chronicles, just like most, uh, most other parts in the Bible, they're, they're not complete. Um, if you compare genealogies in the Bible, you can literally go crazy. Um, getting yourself upset about this. Uh, for instance, Jesus' genealogy in Matthew and Luke, they're different. There's different people in the lists, um, you know, and it's not something that you can just like, oh, well, it's because of the, No, it's, it's two complete different genealogies. And then, um, to make matters more confusing, Matthew uh, makes it where he says there's 14 from here to here, 14 from here to here, and 14 from here to here, when there weren't actually 14 <laughs> In those <laughs> sections, so th- these are things that you know. It, it's just we could talk a long time about genealogies, but let's just summarize all that and not make a long discussion. Of it. We're just saying the genealogies are not complete. Um, this is it's instead it's it's compiled as a record uh, of God's people and His working. This is significant, but um, you know, not don't don't try to compile different. Um, like a lot of people try to compile things where they'll date the earth based on the genealogies. You really can't do that. It, the, it was given for a reason, not f- just for historical purposes. There, there's theological purposes at work. So, um, uh, in Chronicles, it oftentimes will, will record different people that kind of in your mind is going to conjure up historical accounts, but it doesn't actually mention a lot of historical accounts. For instance, Judges, not mentioned in Chronicles. Joshua, not really mentioned. You know, all these different things that we think, hey, that's a significant thing. Chronicles doesn't really seem overly interested in it. Um, and I guess that's just something you have to be okay with because <laughs> whether or not, it still, it still does that. Uh, the eighth thing to consider about Chronicles, um, oftentimes in Chronicles, it will emphasize things that king, kings skipped or vice versa. Kings will emphasize things that Chronicles skipped. Um, and th- these are kind of very significant. Try to keep your eye open for when it does that and w- why, and it'll really help the verses to come alive. The ninth and final thing to consider about about Chronicles, um, the temple is a strong emphasis throughout the book because it was a symbol of God dwelling with his people, and so it had been destroyed. This was the ultimate dis, if you will, the ultimate sign that God was no longer with the people. Um, actually, on Easter Sunday, uh, or Resurrection Sunday, whatever you call it, uh, um, we're actually looking at the significance of Jesus coming in the East Gate, um, which is actually tied to this uh, to this whole thing happening here with the temple. So as you're reading through Chronicles, if you get to Chronicles before Easter, sometimes, sometimes people read ahead, uh, try to pay attention to where the glory of the Lord is. Um, okay. So it was significant. It was showing God dwelling with His people. So it being destroyed was a big thing, and with it being rebuilt, that would have been also a very significant thing. Uh, never can get, get kind of to the meat and potatoes of the book itself. First off, when was it written? As far as we can tell, between 450 and 400 BC. Uh, when did it happen? Now this is kind of an interesting, <laughs> an interesting. Thing. You really can't say when did it happen uh, because it starts off the genealogy with Adam. So you could say from creation to 539 BC. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. How do you want to? How do you want to figure that out? Uh, it has all the genealogies, so technically w- the story picks up after the genealogies. But I mean, I don't know how you want to do that. That's that's your problem now. As far as who the author was, uh, traditionally it was it was given, uh, just not pr- described, but um, can't think of the word right now. But people typically thought it was Ezra. Um, and for uh, there's obvious reasons it happened around the same time as Ezra and Nehemiah. It seems to flow right into the other book. Um, it it just seems like when you're going through it, there's different things, um, the way that the books are together and whatnot. But ultimately, we don't know for sure. Like a lot of these books, um, the o- the thing about them is, um, in most cases with these ones, um, these older Old Testament books. Usually it's a series of people who wrote them, so you really can't say what one person wrote this. I mean, like, for instance, Moses, Deuteronomy was written largely by Moses, but also by someone else because it mentions Moses' death, so it wasn't totally by Moses. <laughs> and that's not to say that somebody later didn't, like, you know, kind of edit it and get it into a, a more um, modern format. I mean, so really, really we're at a loss for a lot of the author, who the authors are. 
And we know that God inspired it, <laughs> so don't get too, too bent out of shape there. But uh, we're really hard-pressed for anything more than that. The main theme of Chronicles is really twofold. First off, the legacy of God's people. You've got the genealogies, which are recorded to show Israel's legacy. You, you have the kings shown to show God's legacy. You have Cyrus allowing them back so that they can go back to their legacy, which is the land. Um, there's, there, there's a focus on the singers. There's a, fi- a focus on the temple activity, which is going to be picked up in Ezra and Nehemiah when they're rebuilding the temple. Uh, a lot of things like that where, where it just constantly shows, um, shows this, this legacy of faith. Uh, for instance, there's this part uh, with Solomon, which is emphasized way more in King, I'm sorry, in Chronicles than in Kings. In fact, oftentimes Chronicles will go on like chapters long thing discussion talking about different spiritual things that happened, and Kings just won't. Um, but in, in Chronicles, there's this part that goes on for quite a bit where they have built Solomon's temple and they're dedicating it, and like there's ho- this whole prayer in there, and there's whole response from God, and they're worshiping God, and this whole long thing, um, which. You know, it takes up a good long deal, and then the action bit that maybe modern historians would be a little more interested in are kind of slim and scarce. And the second main theme of um, of Chronicles is God's promises. You see God's promises constantly referenced, like God said in the prophet Jeremiah, like God said. You know, it constantly goes through these different things, and at the end, you see you see Israel returning, and you have to put yourself in in the in the shoes of the people who are writing this. They don't know how this thing is going to turn out. They don't know what what tomorrow is going to bring. They they've been in exile. They've just been allowed to come back, and so they're writing this in faith, looking forward to hey, God's promises is going to endure. But ultimately, they didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know like God didn't show up and say, "This is everything that's going to happen." Like they just didn't know. So they were going out on faith. They were writing down Chronicles and Kings, by the way, uh, looking forward in faith to what they believed God was going to do, without actually seeing the fruit of God doing it. Um, so very, very significant. Um, once again, kind of lost on us here. Um, Chronicles oftentimes is going to seem a little bit dry. Um, try to focus all the more on the dry parts because that, that really is, is where Chronicles' main points come through the strongest. As far as w- uh, how we can outline uh, the, book of cr- the books of Chronicles, uh, very simple uh, way to break it down here. In chapters 1 through 9, you have the genealogies. And you could, you could do it one of two ways. You could say chapter 10 all the way through the end of St. Chronicles is then the kings. <laughs> or if you want to be a little bit more persnickety about it, you could say chapter 10 to St. Chronicles chapter 9 is David and Solomon. Uh, if you want to go even further than that, you could go, uh, okay, chapter 1 through 9 is genealogies. The rest of First Chronicles is David. The first half of Second uh, Chronicles is Solomon until you get to chapter 10. And then all the way through 36 is the rest of the Judah's kings. So however far you want to break it down, <laughs> that's the basic idea there. So so what? What does it matter that Chronicles is in our Bible? What does it matter that we read it? Well, Chronicles, unfortunately, is often overlooked. When people read through the Bible, uh, they typically go from Genesis and end in Revelation. And so when they do this, they go through Kings and they think, oh, that was interesting. And then they get to Chronicles and they think, I just did this. So they just kind of go through it, but their hearts just kind of not really in it. Because all the things they didn't like about Genesis and numbers, <laughs> it seems like it repeats again, and they're just like, no, why do I have to do this again? Why? And they don't get the point of it, so then they just kind of, uh. and by the time that they get through it, they're just so happy to be in Ezra that they don't really th- stop and think about the, the significance of it. Um, and then you get to Esther, and everybody likes Esther. <laughs> um, so, so, okay. It's often overlooked, but it is a reminder of a broken, stagnant people. And it is a reminder to those broken, stagnant people uh, that the, the, their faith can have fresh vision. So, I mean, these are significant things. Um, uh, we could ask a couple things. Like, maybe is it trying to say God's promises endure even though they seem broken? Uh, kind of, but not really. Could we say we can uh, highlight the positive and just, in bad situations, just highlight the positive and forget about the bad? Well, yeah, but that's not really the idea of Chronicles either. I think a better way would be to say this. If you are a Christian who's fallen away, you got into sin, there is more for you. And I think some books are going to relate to you stronger than other books. For instance, if you're a Christian who used to be on fire for God, and you're just kind of, you're going through the motions, but your religion, your religion is pretty much dead. So Hebrews and Numbers are going to really speak to you. 
if you are someone who was a Christian and you fell out, you got out of church, you got into sin, you're living in regret, you want to get back with God, you just don't know how. Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah are really going to be, really going to have something more for you than, you know, other books. And I think that's just God's way of kind of making the Bible um, really a living book that, that, that really speaks in situations. But um, anyways, even in punishment, God's promises will remain. Uh, in fact, if you could say one thing, you could say that Chronicles is Jeremiah twenty nine eleven in action. You know, where he says, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you. Chronicles literally shows that in action. It p- God's plans to prosper them um, in that. So even God's punishments are given to restore. Uh, would one of you mind going up there and pushing just the down to go on the next slide on the computer? Anybody there? Just And that takes us to Ezra and Nehemiah. Before we get going on it, any questions about Chronicles? Maybe I was unclear about something? or We're all good? What was that, Darla? Did you? Oh, okay. Uh, so Ezra and Nehemiah. There she be. Uh, thanks, Todd. Uh, what happens in Ezra and Nehemiah is God's people return to the promised land and rebuild. I mean, that's a pretty good summary of it. Uh, like I said, in the Hebrew Bible, this is kind of just one book. Um, it's in the English Bible that we have four books, <laughs> four different books. So uh, some things to consider, the four things that I'm going to mention. First, it seems like they were written by the same person. It could, it's possible that they were not. Um, and I'll get to my theory in just a minute. Um, I already mentioned that it's one book in the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's just, it covers the same period. They go together very well. Um, and it seems like the Ezra and Nehemiah is, they went back to rebuild Jerusalem, and this is kind of like their chronicle of it. Um, so the second thing to, to kind of consider about Ezra and Nehemiah is when you get to Ezra chapter 4, so I'm just going to say chapter 3 through 6, it's going to go through a list of oppositions that they faced. It's important that you realize that these oppositions are jumbled. They are not in chronolo- chronological order. Because if you're a historian and you know the order of the Persian kings, it's going to drive you up the wall. You're going to say, what is going on here? <laughs> There's a reason for why things are out of order, okay? First off, it's oftentimes assumed that Ezra comes to the promise, the, back to the promised land at the beginning of the book of Ezra. He does not. That's why when Darius writes his thing in chapter 4 or 5 or whatever, that's why that happens there. It's not, Darius is not out of order. It isn't the right order. It's just that Ezra didn't come at the beginning of the book. He came around like 5 or 6 or somewhere around there. I forget exactly where. Maybe it's 6 or 7 or something. Uh, maybe it's 7. Uh, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing is it starts talking about, I think it's at the beginning of chapter 4, if I remember correctly, it starts talking about the opposition that they face in rebuilding the temple. Then it puts a stop in that, and it starts detailing all the opposition that they face throughout the years in all the rebuilding, not just with the temple. And then it hops back in time, back to the original starting point, to say the, te- the temple work then continued and details the last of the opposition with that. So as long as you remember that, you're fine. <laughs> but if you're a stickler for history and you go through Ezra, Ezra you're going to be like, this is, just, this is just hopeless. It's not. Chronological, look to the future, come back, and going forward. That's kind of how it goes. I don't know why he did that, other than to just kind of highlight the opposition that they, that they uh, were facing. Um. Okay, opposition to the rebuilding throughout the generations. Return of the temple. I already mentioned that. Okay, so then the third thing to consider about Ezra and Nehemiah, divorce is encouraged in the book of Ezra, which is a very troubling thing. And I don't want to really necessarily resolve the issue for you because I want you to kind of weigh it for yourself. Um, I have kind of reached what I think it's trying to say, but there really is no shortchanging trying to wrestle with Scripture. So um, there's kind of this setting that's happening, and I'll just mention a few things that we know it's not. First off, it's not focusing on interracial marriage. Okay, There was a lot of different um, racist groups throughout history that kind of um, misquoted the Bible to try and make it a thing about ethnic purity. 
and a lot of times the Bible was even used to, you know, condone things like Hitler and uh, Nazism, neo-Nazism and all that stuff, but that's not really what's going on at all. Um, the second thing is um, marrying with foreigners was not actually breaking the law um, from Moses. Uh, both of those things are important to consider. So um, they were intermarrying with non-Israelites, non-believers, I, I guess you could say in modern terms, um, which is something they had done before, which the books of Kings, uh, I think, had done a great job of already explaining why that was so terrible. And Persia especially was um, was a place that we all read in our Bible, and we get this idea of Cyrus that I think that is very not accurate. We read about how Cyrus told them they could go back and rebuild the temple, and we think, he was a godly man. No, he was not a godly man. Cyrus had this theory that the best way to appease the people and to stop civil war was to make everybody happy by, by, saying, by saying, you you worship whatever you want to worship. So he thought he could get the favor of all these different gods by having all the people who worship those different gods go back and worship them in peace. And so it's not that he respected Yahweh at all. It's that he was super, super, um, what's it called when you see a black cat and you turn around? Um, superstitious. He was very superstitious, and he wanted all the gods on his side, and he wanted to not have any civil wars <laughs> to deal with. Totally, totally not, uh, not a good guy, just, you know, trying to get around an issue differently than the Babylonians had. Uh, and it was a good idea. It definitely worked for him pretty well. Uh, but the problem is, is that Persia had this whole thing with syncretism, you know, religions coming together, just kind of all get along with each other. And that's kind of what's happening in, in, in Israel. They're, they're marrying these different people um, who, you know, were idol worshipers and, and, and were not interested in Yahweh at all. They just kind of wanted to worship their own gods and do their own kind of thing. Um, so how how do we reconcile that with Corinthians where it says, hey, um, if your unbelieving spouse wants to stay together, you know, um, and there's a lot of things that we could kind of weigh about it, but it seems like the Bible is contradicting itself. So this is something that you really have to go to and pray about it and, and weigh it and kind of just, um, you know, deal with it. I will say this, though. Oftentimes in the Bible, judgments from leaders are given as seemed best to them at the time until an explanation was given. And a great example of this, you just read it probably last week, I think it was last week, maybe the week before. Um, Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, decide to offer uh, something different than God had specifically told them to. And so he burns out in fire and burns them. And uh, so Moses tells Aaron and, and, and the two brothers, you, you cannot make a public show of this. It'll blaspheme God, and he'll, he'll strike you dead where you are. You just need to get through this. And uh, they do. But there's this part where Aaron, right after that, it's like I think the next chapter, the chapter after that, Aaron does not take, does not eat the sacrifice that he's supposed to, and Moses gets hot and, and really irritated at him. And he says, why didn't you do this? And he's about ready to, you know, make a big deal about this. And Aaron says, I don't think that God, it was in God's best interest for me to have done that. And so then Moses backs off. So it could be related to that, but I don't really want to give my opinion. That's just an idea that I want to throw out. Um, about how sometimes a leader will say something that isn't necessarily from God. And I'll leave it with that. Um, that's not necessarily what I believe. I'm just giving you guys some information for you to kind of mod over. Um, I think sometimes we get un too uncomfortable with not having the answers in the Bible, and we rush to get it resolved so we don't feel uncomfortable anymore, and I think that's a big mistake. I think if we would wrestle with it a little bit more, I think that we'd find God speaking to us a little bit more. Because um, the Bible isn't a book of comfort. It's a book very much so of not having comfort, like where he, where he says you have to take up your cross and, and follow me. Well, that's not fun. That's definitely not what I want to do. But these kinds of things that kind of slap us in the face, these are the things that are the most important parts of the Bible that we really have to slow down and pay attention to. The fourth thing to pay attention to, or to consider in Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, many of the Jews from the exile had a hand in global events. Uh, and I'll just mention a couple here. Esther, who saved the people significantly. Uh, Nehemiah, uh, you can read there for yourself, but the way that he was able to, to lead these people and he was able to do things here, very significant things that happened. Jeremiah, who, you know, wasn't just God's prophet, but then when Babylon did conquer, he had King Nebuchadnezzar's 
ear personally. Um, you know, Daniel and his friends who had King Nebuchadnezzar's ear personally. These are global events with the world powers of the time. These are very significant. And uh, I think that that shows us that even in disaster, God is still working. Um, and, and I think that God had a plan. And, and, and absolutely, you just find it just so happens that the right people are in the right place um, to intervene in the situations. So it was written between 500 and 300. And I'll explain that in just a minute. But it happened from about 539 to the 400s, 440. 440, somewhere in there. Um, and the reason why I kind of just rounded off like that is because the wall itself, which is rebuilt in Nehemiah, doesn't take them that long to rebuild. They build it in like a month and a half or something. So it's not that long. But after that, they start doing some reforms. And we really don't know how long the reforms were going for. So we're just going to kind of say the later 400 somewhere and just be done with it. As far as who wrote it, uh, <laughs> Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different ideas um, from Ezra to Nehemiah to all these different things, but I think it's probably a threefold approach, just like with a lot of the other books. Um, there were various, various historians that wrote the first part and some other parts, and Ezra and Nehemiah probably both kept records of these. You know, For instance, uh, in the beginning of Ezra, that immigration Ezra wasn't there for, and neither was Nehemiah. So somebody was recording it. That's what I'm talking about. Some various historians that were just kind of writing things that were significant um, as they went back. And then you have Ezra and Nehemiah, which obviously some parts are written personally with their hand. Um, it's almost written like a memoir, especially when you get to parts of N uh, Nehemiah where he says, remember me for this, God. And you can kind of like hear, hear him personally talking to God. It's just a lot more personal than a lot of the Old Testament uh, that, that we can read. And uh, I think that that obviously kind of yeah, it was Nehemiah who wrote that. But then it seems like there was an editor that, that sometime later, maybe around the 300s, kind of compiled it into a single work, um, and, and just because of the way that it flows. And I, once again, th there's, there's, it's hard to say these things for fact, but when you look back at the manuscripts, it seems like there's this kind of, it would fit very nicely if that happened, which, once again, don't take that for gospel truth. It's just a theory. Uh, we have four dates that are significant. And Ezra and Nehemiah, the first is 538, 539. This is when, uh, when, when Cyrus gave the decree, the first people go back and all that stuff. Um, very significant time. Uh, but this is not when Ezra went back. So then we have the next significant date is four, I'm sorry, 515, which is when the temple was actually finished. It took about, I, I want to say it's about five years. I think they started in 520 and finished it in 515, I think. Um, anyways, it's somewhere around there. Either way, the temple was finished in 515. Then Ezra returned in 458, much after the first decree and all that. Um, and then it was shortly after Ezra returned that Nehemiah returned in 445. Um, so those are all the dates that you should really need because as pretty much as soon as Nehemiah gets there, he, he really starts stirring the pot and getting people to move back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall and all that. Um, so the main theme of Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a lot of people who think there's a lot of different things, but I think it's very obviously um, the main theme is returning to God. I think that's just the absolute obvious thing to me. Uh, you have them returning to the land, rep re rebuilding the, the, the temple, or returning the temple, uh, rebuilding the walls or returning the walls, returning to the law. Just everything about the book is about returning, um, and not just for the sake of returning. It's to reestablish the relationship with Yahweh, so it seems, to me, it seems like the most obvious theme would be one of returning to God. Um, there's a lot of valuable lessons in this book and for two groups of people. I know I've already mentioned Christians who, who messed up and they got off track and they're coming back. But it also has um, some very valuable lessons to pastors who are pastoring what's called a turnaround church. A turnaround church is where a church has gotten to such a place of stagnancy that they're down to just minimal attendance, zero income, it's, it's going to shut down within the next year if there's not immediate action. Um, sometimes they can postpone it to as many as five years if they have enough finances to last them. But um, usually in that situation, there's huge power struggles. Nobody's getting along. They're not doing any outreaches or ministry whatsoever, and they don't really like people. <laughs> When, when a church is in that situation, sometimes you're better just letting it die and starting a new church. I know that sounds harsh, but it takes it takes years to correct a turnaround church. Uh, uh, Tularosa was a turnaround church, and it took um, oh, it was over ten years for us to set things in order. And that was in a small town, a small town of three thousand. Imagine if it was a turnaround church in a big city like you know 
even Albuquerque is not that big, but I mean it's bigger than Tularosa. Um, anyways, um, and I think Ezra Nehemiah just really has a lot of a lot of lessons for when you're rebuilding things. You know what I mean? Rebuilding your marriage, rebuilding your your church, rebuilding your life. It just has a lot of a lot of things there. Um, an outline for Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, I think it can have a relatively simple four-part breakdown. Two parts in Ezra, two parts in Nehemiah. The first part in Ezra, Ezra being chapters 1 through 6, which is about half of it, uh, restoring the temple. You know, they're going there, they're rebuilding the temple, the opposition is recorded, all that. And then you get to the second part, which is 7 through 10, where they're restoring the household. This is the part with the, with the divorce and all that. And the, and the divorce is kind of, it seems like it's just a... a like a stand-in for the idea of restoring the people and their relationship to God. Because it's not really necessarily just about the marriage. It's about what the marriage is signifying and how they are trying to get back on the same page with God. And you, you kind of read through it and you'll see what I'm saying. But I think you can also break it down into, into a further section. And I'm going to tell you that in just a minute. Let's get down to Nehemiah and then I'll have to backtrack a little bit. Uh, Nehemiah breaks down pretty much in half just like Ezra did. Chapters 1 through 7, restoring the walls. Chapters 8 through 13, restoring the law. So if you look, um, the reason why uh, I think I kind of tie these books together in theme, I, I know I already said they're together and being written, but in, I'm tying them together in theme as well, because if you read in the end of Nehemiah, he's going to give a series of reformations that he, that he mentions. And one of the last ones that he mentions is them marrying the foreigners, which was exactly what Ezra ended on. So you see, when it's repeated like that in a book that's already tied together, th there's a reason why God repeats himself. There's usually something, something at play. And uh, this, is, this is the point that I'm getting at. It seems to me like this is, this is the overarching design of Ezra and Nehemiah. You have a statement, an application, a statement, an application. So in Ezra, my, uh, I'm sorry, in Ezra the, the statement would be restoring the temple in chapters 1 through 6. And then the application of that temple, because remember, the temple wasn't just a temple. It was a symbol for God dwelling with his people. What is oftentimes tie, God gives the imagery as? Marriage, right? He's married to his people, the, image of, the imagery of being united with God. And, you know, he, I mean, <laughs> you guys know what I'm saying, right? The way that it constantly ties it in um, with, with their relationship with God being like a marriage. And so then you have restoring the temple, which is kind of like restoring a marriage. And then the second half of Ezra is like a, an application of that, where they're restoring the household. Because what is the root of the church? The household. The families make up the church, right? So I think you could do that. And then if you, go, if you follow that analogy through into Nehemiah, you see the exact same thing happen again. Chapters 1 through 7, restoring the walls. Well, in chapters 8 through 13, he's restoring the law. The law is kind of like a wall for our life. And I know I'm not trying to get too into, you know, mysticalism or whatnot. But it just seems like um, the main theme here is an overarching theme of rebuilding, restoring, coming back to a right relationship with God. Um, and so, okay, you do with that whatever you will. So what? What does it matter that Ezra and Nehemiah is there, that we read it, that it's in our Bible? What does it matter? Well, I think there's three things worth saying. The first thing, I don't think we can say enough how significant, historically speaking, Ezra and Nehemiah is. This is God's people out of the promised land, it seemed like all hope was lost. This is the climax and epitome of all the things that the prophets were warning about. And we have a bunch of the prophets that the historical books were warning about. The entire Bible, from pretty much from Genesis, well, that's a little bit of a stretch, but from Genesis through on through till, well, through till Chronicles, you have this overarching theme of, hey, don't do these bad things, you're going to lose the land. And then Ezra and Nehemiah, they've lost the land. They've lost everything, everything that made them significant. And they're able to come back and get a second chance, which is just mind-blowing in and of itself. Uh, but then it, it, it goes in uh, to good detail there. So very histor historically significant. The second thing, it's important for those trying to get back on track. And I already mentioned this about pastors or Christians. And the third thing, Nehemiah is... Ezra is too, but Nehemiah, I think, is probably the most personal book of the Old Testament. And what I mean by that is what other book can you think of in the Old Testament where he literally interrupts his writing to appeal to God? He's talking about all these trials that he faces, all the ways that he rebuilt, hey, how you doing? All the ways that he rebuilt Israel, and then he interrupts himself to say, remember me for this, God. He doesn't do it once or twice. I mean, it happens 
quite a few times. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's very significant. Uh, and we're getting towards the end of the, um, of the historical books. We've got, uh, if I'm rem- if, unless I'm blinking here, I think Esther is going to be the last one, and then we get to the books of the prophets. Uh, so, yeah. Um, any questions on Ezra and Nehemiah? Anything I said that was kind of confusing? No? Okay. Um, if if you guys think of anything throughout the week, make sure to bring it for, for next week when we finish up the uh, books of uh, history. And, uh, you know, I'm not one into thinking that there's any significance in how the Bible is broken up into verses or, you know, finding hidden messages. In the, I'm not one to do that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I focus more on what did it orig- originally mean and what is God trying to get across in his word. I, I don't try to invent messages from God. I try to get what's there. But there's one thing that's just been going through my mind, and it keeps going over and over again. I was at a conference a number of years ago, probably seven years ago or something, and he brought up this this idea of, of, of fathers being reunited with their sons and families being restored. And... You know, something that he pointed out, which I thought was just so significant, the very last thing that the Old Testament has to say is in the book of Malachi. He says I, that, that he's going to do this thing, which he's talking about the coming Messiah, to restore fathers to their sons and sons to their fathers, lest he come and strike the land. And then it goes straight from there. That's how the Old Testament ends into the Gospel of Matthew, which is talking about God restoring people. I mean, obviously. And uh, I just, it just keep, I don't know why I'm mentioning this. It's just significant, and I keeps going through my head. So I thought I'd throw it out at you. Do with it as thou wilt, uh, Lord. Thank you for your word. Um, thank you that uh, that we can that we have it for us to 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 have and to hold and to cherish and to, and to and to learn from and to grow and to change. Uh, I just pray that you'd help us to uh, to internalize it, help us to memorize it and to chew on it and to always be um, learning from it and to and to be challenged in how we live and how we think and how we talk and how we see and everything, Lord, by, by your word, that we would put it first in everything, and, uh, Lord, that we would love your word. Uh, we love you, Lord. Amen.